today we are honored to um, have uh, two members of the Fisherman team who is visiting Malaysia. Um, Fiona, it's the first time, isn't it? Yeah, uh, no, not the first time in KL, but the first longer, longer time in KL. All right. Well, of course, David has been here for a number of times. Um, and so since they are here, uh, we have been uh, doing some engagement um, with uh, our current developers and uh, our management. And now we wanted to um, share uh, the, uh, the expertise with the whole of the campus today uh, on developing courses on teaching and for uh, the university. So uh, we have um, a, a time until about um, four o'clock, uh, just for four o'clock today. And I would like to uh, first sort of, uh, get them to introduce themselves properly and then uh, talk about um, what Switzerland uh, is choosing in Australia and also how uh, the Switzerland team can support the development of your uh, online course on the Switzerland <laughs> platform. The platform for MOOC to MAP potential in Australia. All right, so over to uh, David David, sir. So, is there a question? Oh, uh... Thank you, Sakir. Um, thanks for the warm welcome. Um, my name is David Granzo. I'm the Regional Director for Future Learning in Asia Pacific. And obviously, um, the University of Malaya is, is one of our four partners. And we're here today to take you through a bit of an overview of what Future Learn does, um, how you can build courses on the platform, um, and how some of the technology works. And throughout the session, I think uh, obviously we will be capturing a few questions. So if there's questions that come up, please feel free to, I guess, put them in the chat and then we'll try to address them as we go along. And I'll now hand over to Thanks, Evan. Hi, everyone. It's lovely to meet you. I see there's another Fiona in the room, so, you know, kudos, my, my sister. Um, I am the Partnership Manager for the Asia-Pacific region for FutureLearn. I'm based in Melbourne alongside David. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, yeah, I look after the Higher Education Institute from um, around the Asia-Pacific region. So I'm very lucky and very proud of my relationship that I have with the University of Malaya and uh, I'm really excited to work with the team here to really grow the opportunities on our platform. So it's really important for us to understand where you're from, uh, what your interests might be, what your specialty area is as well, so that we can help to guide you with building the right content on the platform, uh, how to build a course and really start from the, the very beginning. So if it's okay, um, uh, can I ask that everyone who's in the room virtually just does an introduction to where they're from, the faculty they're from, and maybe what your specialty area is? Starting at the top left with Sup May Core. Hi, good afternoon. Yeah, so uh, what was your question about? Um, are you able to share with us what your study area is, what your teaching area is? Uh, um, okay. um, so uh, currently I'm a lecturer at the Department of Chemistry. So uh, basically I'm teaching all the courses related to analytical chemistry. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Fiona? Hi. Um, I'm Fiona Lee in the English Department in the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. And uh, my department has agreed that uh, we will be mounting a course on Malaysian literature in English um, for um, this platform. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, 
Maybe not there, Manira Faiz. Hello, hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Manira. Um, I'm from uh, Faculty of Medicine. Uh, actually, um, sorry. Uh, I'm from Faculty of Medicine. Uh, uh, I'm a uh, um, uh, lab um, laboratory lab technician. Um, uh, I'm assisting my supervisor uh, in conducting the uh, future learn. Okay. And what was the disciplinary? Sorry, I missed that. Sorry, come again. The I didn't get you. The discipline what? the topic oh discipline oh okay uh it's about um a, a laboratory safety lab safety thank you mm -hmm. uh, anwar yeah hi good afternoon um so i'm uh, anwar razit from the department of biomedical science the faculty of medicine and uh, my specialty is actually in biomedical science right. Thank you. Okay, hi. The next one, maybe uh, a song. Can you introduce yourself? Hi. Hi, I'm Zilui from the Institute for Advanced Studies. So I have actually registered a course uh, entitled The Introduction to Next Generation Sequencing in Hi. future learn yeah. and uh, I'm now working with uh, Encik Anis uh, in uploading all the materials in future learn. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. Thank you. All right, maybe the next one, uh, Kushini. Hi, I'm uh, Kushini from Mechanical Department. Uh, I'm teaching a ma ma uh, mathematics uh, subject here. And basically, I'm uh, new to this uh, future learner, just to want to explore more about the function. Cool. Thank you. All right. So, uh, we continue? So, yeah. yeah, I'd love to know what everyone's doing. So, All it right. helps us to understand if that's okay. It's okay. It's more and more commentary. Okay. Bhavani. Um, hi. Um, I'm Bhavani from the Department of Biomedical Science, Faculty of Medicine. Mm -hmm. um, so my focus area is on biochemistry and some other, a few other miscellaneous courses. So mm -hmm. I would say it's biochem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's my priority at the moment. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> Anyone else want to take the microphone? I could start. It. Yeah. Are there any other faculties maybe? So we've got a lot of sciences and biomedical science. Uh, environmental science, got a bit of, bit of engineering, um, language and literature. Is there anything else that we've missed? Any other faculties or schools? Sorry. Hi. Hi. Uh, I'm a Dr. Said from uh, Physics Department, Faculty of Science. Physics. And uh, I've experienced uh, teaching uh, fundamental physics and uh, even materials. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we've got a bit of a cross-section here. So um, really exciting to be able to share with you some, some about our company. Uh, and between David and I, we'll try to um, convey some of the reasons why people like yourself might want to work on the platform, how we can make it the most valuable for all of you to get something out of it as well. And there's different reasons why people use FutureLearn. So... Uh, it's one of the conversations we're having at a more strategic level with the university on pathways and student pipeline. But there's also other opportunities to be able to create uh, revenue opportunities. Um, it could be dissemination of research and so on. So we'll look at some of the different products that we have and how you are a user. One of the great things to know is that because FutureLearn and the University of Malaya have an agreement, and I believe that's about to happen again for another three years. 
three or four. That's correct. There's an opportunity. <laughs> There's an opportunity there for you to use the the platform. There is no cost for you to you to put most of our products on the platform. So um, when I say most, it's actually most of what the University of Malaya use the platform for. There is no charge for you. Um, we're just going to share screen. <laughs> and this is, we can share that one. Yeah, that's perfect. So what we're waiting to share a screen. Um, maybe I'll just give it a bit of history and context for, for those of you that don't know much about FutureLearn. So FutureLearn's been around for a little over 10 years, almost 10 years. Um, and it was originally born out of the open. <laughs> Um, and essentially, uh, the, the idea was uh, taking the distance learning principles that uh, Open University had learned and applying it uh, more in an online format. Um, fast forward to today, uh, FutureLearn is a um, online platform that has about 19 million students uh, from all over the globe, um, and we're, we're Really excited about uh, some of the opportunities of actually disseminating some of the content that the university has to that global audience, and indeed um, looking to build a longer term partnerships where um, we can also uh, meet skills demands of the future as well. So, um, yeah, I think hopefully we'll hmm, kick I'm just off. Having a little bit of trouble sharing the screen so that you can see what we're presenting to. I think the audience can. Can you see what we're sharing? Oh, that's good. I'm just checking that everyone can see. Can everyone see what yeah, we're sharing? Yeah, we can see, but we can see the presenter view. Uh-huh. Presenter uh, view. Uh, okay. Right. Yes, just seeing the presenter. Just give us a minute or two. We'll just uh, try and solve these tech. Okay. Um, a little bit of other context. Um, I guess the future learn, uh, as you would know, is obviously predominantly European, European and based in the UK. Um, we do, however, have a small team based out of Australia these days. Um, which is here to support you, as well as um, uh, the, the broader UK team of our learning design and content teams. Um, additionally, over the last number of years, we've been sort of focusing on evolving some of the features and, uh, of the platform. And today we host a, a whole range of types of courses, everything from short courses through to full degrees. Um, and yeah, it, it's just an opportunity, obviously, for learners to engage at different stages of their learning cycle uh, on the platform. Fiona, anything to add? I'm sorry, I was just trying to get back to the link. Yeah. Um, let's just see, can you see that screen now? Can someone please confirm that they can see the screen? We can see it. Slideshow. That's okay. We can. We don't need to see it so much. Apologies, it's taking a little while longer just to get everything up and running. Can you select that one? Right? So uh, I think I'm, 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 okay. Is it working? Yes. 
Yeah, so we can see that. Can everyone see that screen now? University of Malaya Future Learn screen? Yes. Yes. Now we can't hear anyone. Yeah. Oh, great. Fantastic. Okay. Brilliant. All right, we'll get started. Yeah. So as I mentioned before, we're just going to give a brief overview of um, Future Learning the Platform, a uh, bit about the audience, um, and then we'll talk to you about how you can build courses, how they can be facilitated online, um, and obviously a bit about the pedagogy and, and answering any questions. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. <laughs> Oh, there we go. Oh, brilliant. Okay. So, um, as I mentioned before, uh, FutureLearn was born out of the Open uh, University in the UK, but it's now a jointly owned venture. So, it's today owned by uh, the SEEK group. Uh, many of you may know some of the SEEK entities around the world. Uh, most relevant here in Malaysia it would be Jobs Street and Jobs DB, uh, the big jobs platforms. Um, and Seek is a, a globally one of the larger job platforms. Um, and they are 50% uh, shareholder of the FutureLearn business alongside the OU founding um, partner. So with that comes um, a few abilities from FutureLearn that uh, other platforms don't have. We have the ability to see um, jobs and skills, you know, what, what are the demands, where, where are they lacking? Um, or, you know, was there a lack of skills and, and what kind of content is needed to address those skills uh, moving towards the future. And, that, and I guess that's what um, we're designed to do while delivering access to education. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, so here's a bit about the future loan strategy. The um, overall future loan strategy is what we call our house model. Um, as you'll see there, uh, fundamentally, we're about transforming access to education. That's the has always been our primary goal and continues to be so. And then we've made some adjustments over um, whilst releasing this new strategy. It is uh, by 2026, we're aiming to expand and, and obviously um, not only address the business to consumer market, which is what most of the courses do today, but also address the business to business market um, and help our partners uh, meet the needs of those businesses as well. Next slide, please. Um, a little bit about our products. Um, many of you might have seen or uh, some of the products on the, the platform already. Um, the University of Malaya currently has mainly short courses on the platform and uh, one expert track that recently uh, launched. Um, we also house micro credentials and degrees. A little bit uh, about the differences of each one of those products. So short courses typically um, an open course where a learner can go and learn free and then they they sort of pay uh, to take the assessment element and, and receive a certificate an expert track is a subscription-based model so it's a series of courses building towards a particular expertise and then obviously micro credentials uh, carry university credit and or professional accreditation um, and that, that's something that we're speaking with the University of Malaya context around what that looks like for uh, the University of Malaya. And then full degrees, um, as most of you would be aware, is, is full award programs, but just delivered in online format. Next slide, please. Um, I guess a little bit more in depth about micro credentials and professional certificates, which is something that we're seeking to explore with the university. Um, Typically, they vary between, say, 20 to 150 hours. Um, they carry accreditation. Um, and ultimately, it's, it's geared at a learner to either upskill or build 
towards um, a full qualification of retirement. I'm still going to jump through to an overview because they're all. Can we jump through to the uh, overview, please? Keep going. Next. Next. Keep going. And again. Keep going. One more, I think. Two, three more. Three more. Yes. Fantastic. Who are future learners? Thank you. Um, and don't be disappointed. The only reason why I was skipping through those was because uh, we presented them about micro credentials. So there was just a few too many there for this session. Um, but of course, you're welcome to, to review them as well. So, who are our future learners? Um, we span globally. Uh, with being a British company, we have a very strong learner base in the UK. But you'll also see that a really strong region is in APAC. So the Australia Pacific region has grown exponentially over the last couple of years. We're also seeing a really strong growth in uh, Africa and the North Africans and uh, throughout that region there. So. Um, the global database, the, the global learner base does change according to uh, what's going on around the world. And we'll have a look at some of those countries that, that feature um, within our data in the top sort of 20 or 40 countries of this at point. Uh, mostly skewed towards female over male. So um, it's quite a strong 60 40. Um, I've also got some data on Malaya's current courses and your current learners shortly. So it'd be really interesting for you just to um, do a comparison with those, those numbers. The 26 to 45 age group is very strong. Likewise, the under 26 and 46 to 45. But in saying that, there's still the over 65. And we were talking with one of the educators earlier and he was noting that a lot of his learners are over 50. So there's certainly courses that appeal to the older learner. Majority of our learners, though, are looking at the skills uplift and, and skills build, uh, whether it's to secure the better, better job or uh, a career-changing sort of um, approach as well. Next slide, please. So this is our top 40 countries based on current enrolments. I think I pulled the data on Friday, so it's very new. It does fluctuate a little bit, um, you know, interesting, depending on what's happening around the world. It was certainly moving quite rapidly when people were in lockdowns, countries were in lockdowns. Um, Australia, it's circa sort of 850,000 learners, so that gives you an idea of what falls beneath that. Uh, and then upwards from there, like I said, the Egypt, Nigeria, those areas, um, within Africa and, and that region are, are very strong. We're seeing massive growth. Likewise, in the subcontinent, so you've got India and Pakistan yeah. highlighting there. The United Kingdom... Oh, um, the United Kingdom is one of our biggest pools of learners, so um, you'll see pretty much every course I think I've ever um, seen on the platform does have a really uh, number one will usually always be United Kingdom, but India, uh, Egypt and Pakistan are certainly growing up the ranks. These do fluctuate, like I said, so we could draw the data in, in seven days' time and it would be slightly different, but I think you'll see that sort of top seven will stay fairly similar over, over time. Next slide, please. Uh, so our learners, once again, based on current enrolments drawn on Friday, so uh, largely working full-time or part-time or self-employed. So if we add all of those buckets together, including our full-time students or those looking for work, and you can see that there's a, a strong demand for the skills building. So where we can be putting courses on that are going to enhance skills building, that's going to serve the purpose for those that are working full and part-time, self-employed, looking for work and part and full-time student. Uh, the retired, not working and unemployed, they certainly make up a, a population there that we need to um, allow, allow course content to align to as well. Next slide, please. Our education level has changed over time. So during Future Learn's existence, I think we've seen it go from more of a 
a social engaging platform to um, quite a high education level. So similarly, if we add up anyone with a degree there, um, tertiary, doctorate and university and master's and degree, you can see that it makes up a very large chunk of our population. So we've got a, a very smart learner base. They come to us with a degree um, or looking towards enhancing that somehow. So when we talk about pathways, this is really important to think of where we're pitching it and how we're pitching the content to the learner. Thanks, I please. Where our learners come from. So these are our top 20 segments. Um, the teaching and education, health and social care is a, one of our strongest, two of our strongest uh, segments. Uh, I think if you ask most people about any of the EdTech platforms, FutureLearn would definitely stand out for both of those. In saying that, though, there's a, a large growth in the IT, the business and consulting area and the others that are listed there. So once again, they don't tend to fluctuate too much. Uh, and this is, I guess, based on where our learners tell, them, tell us that they're currently employed. Next slide, please. Uh, this is definitely of interest for any of you thinking of building a course, hopefully all of you. Um, so, like I said, our, our topic area, our segment areas are going to be around healthcare and education, um, which is why you'll see a lot of those types of courses featuring here in our leading topics. What we don't want to do is throw a course up online that is an exact replica of another course online. So this gives us an opportunity to see where our demand is, where our learners are coming from. So then we work through the team here at Malaya to understand where that white space might be or where that niche might be for your course and your topic area amongst all of the other courses. So we don't want it to be... Um, cannibalised by a course that's on there. We want everyone's course to perform to its best ability. So this is yeah, I'm interesting um, for any of you that are in this space. We've learned where some of you are from, some of your background areas, and I think you'll find a lot of them feature in there. Did anyone have any questions before we keep going on about those? And feel free just to pop your mic on and ask a question. Probably no question. No question? No well, question. Is, what uh, is UX? So that's um, user experience. So technical term, you're the technical no, man. Rang. No, so user experience is typically UX. also aligned to something uh, around uh, user experience and sort of design. Um, so typically, um, either design of uh, a game or design of um, a website or a platform, that sort of thing, and that's user experience. Thank yeah. you. Uh, so Fiona's just asked a question about the numbers here. Is it representative globally or of Malaya? And that's a great question and a great segue into the next lot of data, which is going to be based on Malaya's courses alone. So this is overall, this is all of our learners on our platform, of which we are around 20 million learners. Uh, next slide, please. And one, oh, actually, we can talk to you. You might want to talk to this. You like it, too. <laughs> got a blank slide, so I'll go with that now. There we go. Um, yeah, so I, I guess one of the things I highlighted a little bit earlier was around the, the uniqueness of future and the whole and the, um, the fact that uh, the, the joint ownership structure enables us to tap into data. Well, here's an example of, of um, Seek Asia advertisement data year on year in terms of jobs and skills. Um, and you can see that there's sort of fluctuation between industries. Um, and this is the type of data that, that we use in order to help um, our university partners or our industry partners make decisions around what the, the type of content that they're going to create and put on the platform. Um, it's to make sure that ultimately that we're, we're meeting the needs of, of learners out in, out in the market. 
So probably not a big surprise for some of you, you know, information uh, technology, communications, that sort of thing is, is a growing area. But there might be some surprises in there. Um, Accounting. Terms, you know, <laughs> might be some surprises in terms of the, there's actually less jobs in some of the areas that there might have previously been. Next slide, please. So now we're going to talk about some existing courses. So where did Malaya's learners come from? <laughs> Thanks, David. So this is... Um, to your question earlier, Fiona, is um, this is drawn from all of the learners on the Malaya courses so far. So um, with a growing portfolio and uh, some of them have only been on the platform for a very short time, this is obviously going to change over, over the course of the next 6, 12 months. So it'll be really interesting to refer back to these uh, slides in 6 months and 12 months and just compare but as you can see there, the United Kingdom definitely features up the top. Uh, Malaysian University Malaya brand is well recognised within Malaysia, so therefore courses are undertaken by local students. And that's really important to note because when we're talking about pathways and the potential of uh, trying to capture some of the students as a lead generation into some of the University Malaya award courses, You've already got a captive audience there who are doing University of Malaya courses on our platform. Unknown, unfortunately, they don't want us to know where they're from or their um, their IP address is um, not giving us the data for some reason. India is also growing rapidly, um, so it'd be really interesting to see where again in 12, 6, 12 months' time uh, the Indian population. Um, knowing that Malaysia has a large Indian population as well, um, once again, the brand is going to be recognised. Vietnam, US, and then uh, we're looking through Southeast Asia and over into to some parts of Africa as well. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. This is, once again, Malaya's learners, so um, an aggregate of all of the courses and all of the, the learners. So... We talked before about the gender being 60-40. You can see on um, Malaya's, it's just slightly lower, slightly shifted, but it's it's fairly fairly the same. The learner age range, um, it's probably grown a little bit more for that under 26. Oh, it's done it. <laughs> We've just been able to see the slide. Um, so it, it's actually almost fairly evenly spread between the 18. So that real entry school leader um, is looking at some of the undergraduate programs all the way through to sort of the mid-40s there. Uh, and then an older generation of learners as well. Similarly, though, to the, the other data you've got working full-time being those predominantly taking uh, Malaya's courses. Uh, Things have shuffled a little bit there, so you've got more students interested in your courses than, say, the comparison with our FutureLearn learner, um, the data I showed you earlier. But, you know, typically they sort of fall around that, that level. Next slide, please. So we put this together for some of the team that we presented to, and I think it's really relevant to share with you as well because we have... Uh, in the UK, part of our team is an insights team and they do a lot of research into understanding uh, where the demand is globally, where the demand is with our learners, where our gaps are on the platform and where our partners' um, capabilities lie and they marry all of that data together. And so what they've come up with is some suggested areas um, that are aligned to our strategic areas as well. So Look, really, it's food for thought. Uh, you're all here from different schools and faculties, so there may be something that piques your interest. And if there is, then we're really happy to help guide you through the process alongside um, Zahia and the team. Next slide, please. So we talked about pathways. Uh, there's a lot of partners that we work with that use the platform for uh, bringing in new learners into award programs. That can be straight from a short course or an expert track, so those smaller form courses. 
direct into, oh, I'm really interested in the University of Malaya. I like the way they teach. And so they start looking at other courses here. There could also be where they want to build their skills in, say, a micro-credential, knowing that they're going to get credit into the university when they've completed that. So that was part of the conversation that we had this morning is about having that uh, higher level um, qualification um, or award associated with what we call a micro-credential. And it's worth highlighting that there are differences between what we call a micro-credential and what the Malaysian uh, micro-credential framework talks about as well. So there are professionals out there who want to continue to build those skills. A micro-credential is a great pathway into to be able to do that, to get to the university again. Or it may be that they're upskilling in that particular topic and they exit there. So they're a fee-paying type of course. Listed underneath pathways are some of FutureLearn's strategic portfolio areas. Uh, as I said, healthcare and education is massive for us. Um, likewise, psychology fits in there as well. Sustainability is a, a rapidly growing uh, collection for us of courses. There's an ambition for FutureLearn to be the leader in uh, a single space to go to for climate change and sustainability curriculum. And I think we've got about 130 courses. Something to I that. think they're aiming, they're aiming to get to 500. Uh, business and management, we see a lot of learners, I guess because business and management is so broad and it's across every single discipline, um, we see a lot of learners come through business and management types of courses. That could be in your soft skills, transferable skills. It could be things like the project management. There's always going to be an appetite from learners in any area to be able to take courses in that space. And then digital is a rapidly growing area for us on future learn. It's never been one that we've focused on, but it's certainly um, growing quite, quite rapidly for us. On the right-hand side, uh, I mentioned before about the uh, the insights team that we have in the UK that layer a lot of this data together. And they've looked at some of UM's capabilities as well, and they've pulled out these five uh, spaces where um, particular areas where we've got a gap on our platform at the type of level that we would like to see those courses come in at uh, and the topic areas that we'd like to see in that space. Knowing that, when I talk about University of Malaya to others, these are some of the things that stand out to them. These are some of the, the topic areas, the discipline areas that, um, that University of Malaya shines in. I'm sure there's lots of others, don't get me wrong. Uh, these were just the ones that, that seem to match up with the highest demand. Um, I think that was it. There is one more slide, but it's probably not overly relevant. I guess we can talk about it there really just as options that we can do a bit of add on. So we build the course and there's opportunities for us to be able to build the marketing capabilities within the course. The data matching is a uh, work in progress at the moment with Malaya. We want to know, we all want to know, uh, how many learners have started on the Future Learn platform and go on to study at the University of Malaya. They could also come from they're already studying at Malaya, they come and do a short course on future learn and they decide to go back to Malaya. So there's, there's no necessarily linear formation. Uh, so that storytelling, I think, will be great to share with all of you. Um, it's certainly good for us to know. Uh, we hear from other partners that there's a lot of value for them in the investment that they have putting courses on future learn is well paid off when they've got students who are enrol enrolling in other courses. And then the final one really is down the bottom, the CPD. So where possible, if we can um, encourage industry and um, peak body accreditation, we do see a dramatic uplift in learners choosing to pay for the certificate, which ends up benefiting the, um, the revenue earned on, on each of those courses. So the CPD, we have a, a gener generic CPD process that we can apply for. 
but I think also where there's a peak body, um, as an example, uh, we've just launched a course with Hong Kong University, the medical school, and that's in collaboration with um, a peak body uh, anesthesia body. So um, where there's that stamp of CPD approval, then um, you can imagine that it's, it becomes much more attractive to professionals. Is there anything else you'd like to add, Phil? No, not all. <laughs> um, so that was a lot of information. Um, I can't see any of you. But um, we do have a screen here now, so we can see ourselves. But um, if there's any questions at all, I really want to open up the floor um, for you to ask questions, and we are more than happy to answer. Excellent. So. Um I guess that was a brief sort of overview around what FutureLearn is doing from a strategic point of view, um, you know, the different types of courses and content that we have on the platform, some of the data that we can share with you. Um, but I guess fundamentally it, it really comes down to is there any particular questions around courses, content, um, anything that we can show you the, the uh, around the future learning platform itself that that will um, uh, answer any specific questions that you have so i'm happy to take questions very quiet okay. ah. Are you launching the platform? I won't be able to go into it, but I can actually um, bring it up for them to see. So if, if you want to talk to it, I'm happy to just so they can see that one. Thank you. So I just want to confirm me can you actually see the platform itself? Uh, Just going to share the screen real quick. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. Well, that, one. that one. All right. How about now? Yes. Excellent. You've got there, haven't you? Okay. So go Fantastic. So we'll take you on a little bit of a quick tour around future learning. Might might pull up a few courses that we can suggest that you have a look at. Much more, I think. Um, We'll go straight to the university's existing courses on the platform. Um, and here, here you can see just an outline on the university itself. Um, each one of our partners has a partner page like this, um, and, and this highlights uh, the, the courses that are available from that partner. I see there's a few questions popping up, so we'll address okay. them as we go. Um, and currently there's uh, an expert track and obviously then 16 additional short courses on the platform. Um, and some of those form part of the expert training. Mm -hmm. Yes, some issues. Yes. If you go to the chat, please. Um, check. Oh, yeah, I can actually. Brilliant. Okay, question. Do you have general guidelines around how much time it takes to plan a four week course? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, if you're, is it instructional design, the engineering, she did it in two months, didn't she? Yes. Yeah. But that's quite unusual. So it's normally, so the academic instructional design, is it? yeah, so she turned the course over in two months, which is quite fast. So we would typically think uh, anywhere between <laughs> um, three to four months is fairly standard. So you have to factor in that at the end, once you've built the course uh, and our team have written the course description page, we then have to go through a full quality assessment, quality, quality QA. So we need to make sure that all of your links are working, that the learner is going to be engaged throughout the course and um, we've got a fairly 
substantial QA document that we like to be able to share with partners um, so that they can meet that QA. And in terms of the quality assurance process, maybe one thing um, that's a document that can be supplied, I think, so here through your team, uh, to, so that if there's any educators, academics that, that want to have a look at that in advance, we should be able to facilitate that. Yeah. Um, Good question. Who owns the course content once it's up on FutureLearn? Well, the answer is it's still the university's IP, mm. uh, fundamentally. So FutureLearn is a delivery platform. Um, so we're there to deliver the content, but the content is ultimately owned by the university or the content owner. Next one is yours. Yes. Yeah. So I'll probably take the, uh, the next question. Uh, what kind of support are available in AUM? So uh, we um, provide full support to our uh, educators uh, in AUM uh, who's uh, developing course on the uh, future platform. So we have a team of instructional designers who uh, help you design and also produce the courses. So that means we will uh, help you with the uh, instructional design uh, to, to pinpoint or to determine uh, what kind of learning that takes place uh, on, on the platform. Uh, what kind, if you need to be, you need to uh, uh, shoot videos, for example, then uh, we will help you to do that. Of course, uh, we will need you to uh, prepare the script for that with our guidance. So we will uh, guide you uh, throughout the process and uh, basically uh, full support uh, for you to be able to uh, create uh, and complete the course uh, on the platform and have it published. So, and we do also uh, a little bit of marketing to our um, social media and also we, we collaborate with the um, uh, marketing office or international relations office to also um, market the courses on uh, our uh, official news platform. Yes. Cool. Do you want to take the yeah. question? So Charity's asked a question, is it possible to edit the course once it's published? And if so, to what extent? Um, so absolutely, yes, you can edit the course. Um, we allow for any course to be edited uh, if there's minor adjustments to be do to have that done while the run is happening, so while learners are in the course. However, if there's major issues or you've identified, um, and we were talking before about a video with one of the other educators that the sound wasn't very good. So with something like that, she's decided to go in and make some more um, detailed changes to the course. The easiest thing for that is to create a new run, to make all of the adjustments in the new run, and then when it's ready, you just switch that run on. What it does is it actually enables the learners in the current run, they're not affected at all, and anyone new to the run goes into the, the run that has been updated. So it's all very user-friendly. So the UX, the user experience of the student or the learner that's um, on the front end of the course, they don't see anything uh, different to, to the course that they're in or the new course coming up. So, yes, absolutely, you can. And we want you to improve the course based on any feedback. And somebody raised their hand. So uh, we would like to invite yeah. uh, Dr. Amira to... Dr. Amira, you've got your hand up. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks, Dr. Zahir. And Thanks, Ms. Fiona. Um, I was just wondering if Dr. Zahir can just maybe talk. Uh, can you hear me? Oh, we can't hear. Okay, I'm sorry. sorry I was just. Maybe you want to uh, type in your question, probably. Uh, okay. All right. I'll, I'll type in the question. Thank you. Oh, here we go. Oh, okay, here we go. So, if three universities co develop the content, can the content be published on all three university pages in FutureLearn? 
as long as all three agree, yes. Um, fun fundamentally, uh, we have had some examples of jointly created content uh, previously but between universities where it showed up on both universities' pages. Um, it can be done. It's a little bit more complex, um, but it is something that we can facilitate. I was just going to show the Deakin and Coventry. Where is that it's, one? Uh, no, no. Not happening. No. Mm. Um, I guess the other thing, uh, maybe what we'd like to do is go and show you some examples and some courses. There you go. There's a, a joint Deakin and Coventry investigating in the innovation course. Um, so if you do that course, it gives you recognition that both. And likewise, you'll see it on here as yeah. well. So that's an example. Um, yes. Any other questions? coventry has got so many courses. Um, Fiona, maybe we, can, there. Yeah, maybe we can log into uh, an can't. actual course. I can't. Um, oh, maybe one that I've already joined. I could. Yes. And uh, then I need to log in. And uh, what about the, the team? The team log into uh, your course creator? Yes. Is that possible? Yes, they're in. Whose is this one? Is this yeah, yeah, ready? course creator. Perfect. Yep. That's them. Course creator. Okay, here we go. Talk to us here. Quality assurance processes. Can you differentiate between future lens quality assurance versus relation uh, operational definition of okay. uh, QA? Hi, thank you, Alexandra. Uh, always you ask the, mm. the hard questions. <laughs> so, um, unfortunately, I'm not familiar with the uh, MPA's uh, audit. Uh, I would imagine uh, uh, MPA's audit would be uh, the audit. For PISA, if I'm not mistaken, um, correct me if I'm wrong. So, uh, so to to audit uh, against the PISA and also QA from the future side, I think this would be uh, much easier if you do the, if, if if it would be much easier when you do the QA with the future team or, or on on creating content because uh, we are auditing the uh, the, the the QA is for a single cost only, whereas um, um, QA of uh, MQA would actually cover programs. So uh, I think that's a large difference there when uh, you are um, auditing a program versus a cotton. I can also add that. Um, Additionally, to, to add to that, um, so FutureLearn is not auditing the content for uh, the content or the learning outcomes per se, like like an audit that would be done at a at a MQA level. What we're mainly auditing for is usability of the course, access to enable learners to access everything inside the course. So, for example, we'd want to ensure that um, there aren't any broken links to particular resources. We'd want to make sure that all video content as um, transcripts uh, for accessibility reasons. We'd want to ensure that uh, a lot of video actually has the ability to have subtitles, those sorts of things. So when we talk about quality assurance, it's, it's more about making sure that uh, the content can be absorbed by the learner um, uh, on the platform without creating any barriers per se. Um, I believe we're going to actually show you the outline of the quality assurance process. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we'll just pop it up on the screen real quick, just to give you an indicator of uh, um, exactly the sort of questions that we ask. And to, can you just put a caveat that this is someone's? Uh, no, that's not the right question. We're doing uh, fantastic uh, on the technical side terrible. today, as you all can tell. Uh, here, we here we go. All right. So we'll share that one. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah. Okay, the, so this is a, a, an example of someone. Uh, uh, All the assurance and, and feedback on the existing courts that's being worked on now. Um, but here you can see um, it's a sort of an outline. Uh, the activities and the steps are, are all asked and uh, added in here. So, sort of courses are broken down by weeks. Um, the, and then here we're looking in this particular case at the, at the actual uh, social learning aspects. Um, you know what's actually required, uh, whether or not they pass the QA, and then it's it's as we mentioned, it's a bit of a lengthy document, but fundamentally it's. It's to guide through the development process to ensure that learners are getting the best outcome. Um, and that's that's what the QA process mm -hmm. is designed for. So this is really fun. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see here, uh, here's an example of a, a link out to an exercise step that's not working. So it has something that requires a fix. Um, I think if we go back and actually view what uh, well, I think we should show as an actual course mm -hmm. um, the inside, the back end of the course, so we can actually see. Um, because a lot of the, the educators won't have actually seen the back end of Future Learn before, mm -hmm. so we'll, we'll, so we'll use a. Uh, so here's. We'll use the building pathology uh, course, which is in progress of being built, but fundamentally in the background, this is, you can see it's a draft shell of a course. Um, Along the top, there's a few different things that you can do. So you've got the, the details in this case, and it, it stipulates uh, the course itself, um, what's in the course, how long it is, um, who's it for, that sort of thing. This is the public view. Um, and this is the public view of the content or how it would be viewed by the public. Um, what we'd like to do now is actually go in and show you um, what the actual building view of the course is. Um, so if we go to the content tab, you'll see here that it's broken down into weeks. And each one of those weeks is broken into steps, um, which are the smaller. So consider um, it building blocks, essentially, on how, how you build a course. So a week is the largest building block, followed by a step. And then a step can be broken down into further activities. Um, and so here are examples of um, you know the first step in in this week one. It's nice to meet you. It's a video content uh, following by a bit of an article around who the educator is, um, and then what you're actually going to learn in, in week one in the video. And then it goes on to um, um, further build on that learning. And then at the end of the, the, the week, there's a, um, a sort of an assessment task that can be done. And maybe to highlight on the assessment tasks itself, um, there are quizzes and there are tests and there are also portfolio assessment tools that can be used. So depending on the type of content and the type of learner that you're um, building content for will depend on the type of assessment um, that you use. And then... Usually at the end of every week, there's a sort of a wrap up or um, a feedback loop um, for the learners themselves. So that's just to give you an idea of the inside of the course. And I don't know, maybe Zia, you can articulate a little bit about your thinking process around uh, the, when you when you started structuring this course. Okay, I think, um, uh, yeah, and so the, the course uh, was actually designed as part of the class that I'm teaching. So, uh, but it only covers half of that class. So uh, it, the, the subject name is building pathology and they have a course code and everything. Uh, it is an MQA accredited um, uh, course. And uh, at the same time, it's accredited also by the professional body. So my thinking behind building this course is that it can become um, uh, like an initial cost for those who wanted to uh, go into uh, uh, building surveying um, as uh, uh, a university course and also as a professional, 
um, qualification. Uh, I'm gearing the cost bill towards uh, two, uh, it, it, it is really a two-prong strategy. So the cost will be available for learners who wanted to um, uh, gain credits to go into uh, UM's uh, business surveying department uh, courses. And at the same time, uh, I'm uh, now talking with um, the uh, Royal Institution of Surveyors so that they can also accredit the cost for CPD uh, for uh, building survey professionals. So it's uh, so it's quite ambitious um, in, in, in that sense. But I'm trying to uh, now uh, make making sure that I'm, I'm trying to make sure that uh, I can finish the course on time. <laughs> <laughs> now that we've been here. <laughs> um, I also just wanted to show you from the back end um, as an educator some of the view that you would have. So if we go into one that has just recently been launched yesterday, um, you also have the opportunity to see what the statistics are and the data that has been collated for you. So this will give you an insight into the learners, how many learners are active, um, they provide survey data, post-course survey data here. Some of it is free text, so it's really valuable information to read. Um, the enrolments, you can actually see the activity levels and so on. If we have a look under course measures, you can also see that there's active learners here. Um, you can see where they're engaged. So that it's only started yesterday. So there's a very, very early pipeline of learners here that haven't even got to 50% completion. So this is really, this is on every course. So if you build a course, you have access to the, this information for your course as well. Um, and then, yeah, there's some really great data sets that are in there. Likewise, in facilitation, you can see here on the facilitation dashboard how your course is run. So as we said, there's very few people that are even up to this stage yet. So the engagement is happening in this early part. There's a peak here at 1.4. It's only two days in though, so we have to give this some time to mature. Um, any comments and feedback here? We can see, um, you know, the beautiful work of art, the composition is balanced, two well-defined areas. You know, some really lovely stories here. Someone doesn't like what they see. This is one response, so that's why that's at 100%. So let's take that with a grain of salt for this moment in time. Um, but you can see here that, uh, you know, there's some really lovely conversations that are starting to take place. And when you sort of peel back the, the onion skin to, to what is future learn underneath, it's all about this peer-to-peer -peer engagement with social learning. So we're advising the academics to not be in here for hours a week talking to students and commenting. Let the students, the learners, talk to each other. So there's some really good engaging uh, conversations happening here and it sounds like already these people are going to start talking to each other and that's the social learning pedagogy that underpins what future learning is all about. Hmm. Is there any other questions that have emerged? Oh, here we go. Here we go. Student Director Renee Synchronous, yeah. Okay, so... You mind reading the question? Uh, yes. Oh, some Amiris just said, just to explain that the QA process is quite easy and straightforward and doesn't require much documentation. It's more of a checklist. Yes. That's correct. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Uh, so Fiona's asked the question, are courses on future learn mainly student-directed and asynchronous? Do students submit assessments for evaluation, especially if they're seeking certification? Are instructors at UM expected to give feedback or mark assessments for students not seeking certification? So, very uh, good question, Fiona. So, fundamentally, um, courses can be built to be 100% asynchronous or uh, in a lot of cases with the existing University of Malaya courses, they have an element of facilitation in them, but for only periods of time throughout the year. So, um, most short courses don't actually have marked assessment, as it were. It's, it's an automated uh, assessment on, on the tests and quizzes that are embedded in the platform. 
that grant you the certificate. Only marked assessment would happen is if it is relevant to a certification, um, and that may be a micro credential or, or um, a, a professional accreditation, um, whereby the university's already got that pre arrangement. In most cases, those types of assessments uh, would be a link out from Future Learn the platform into the University of Malaya's assessment system for the learner to submit the assessment directly to the university if it was to be assessed. So in the case of, say, uh, if we are to uh, create a micro-credential that requires um, marketing and assessment, um, we would then create a link between FutureLearn and um, uh, the University of Malaya's Moodle instance, for example, so they could submit their assessment in that way. Hopefully that clarifies. Um, yes, perfect. So share screen. Do you want to share that? Okay. Oh, there it is. Um, I thought maybe if we've got. Okay, so there's phone. another question. Oh. Are these courses given uh, by a competent? And what are the requirements to own or contribute to one? So let me try and address this question. So, mm -hmm. uh, yes, um, uh, what Melissa said, so, uh, we uh, in the University of or advocate for our uh, educators, our experts uh, in, in the field, uh, whatever school you are, to uh, deliver the cost yourself. So, um, if you see the shared screen here, so this is a uh, someone who is actually a, an educator in uh university of newcastle now uh, newcastle yeah it's newcastle yeah yes. yes, that's correct um or who's who's creating the course um right. and and myself uh, i'm also creating the course based on on my uh, own uh, expertise so um, of course we want yeah you so uh, from from where you are so that means if you're from mathematics you would like me to uh, create a mathematics course and not a baking course mm -hmm. uh, if, 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 uh, if that's, that's uh, the, yeah. the, 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 the thing that you wanted to ask. Um, and the, the requirement uh, is um, um, actually there's no uh, specific requirement other than you teach you teach in the uh, platform as uh, how you teach in your own uh, course which, uh, if you're, what you are what you're expert at. Um, and um, do come to us um, and talk to us uh, at edX so that then we can um, um, uh, guide you and help you and support you uh, for the um, development and also the, uh, the publication of your course. Um, there's a question there around, uh, it takes around four months to create a course. It could take four months, it could take four days. It could take... 18 months, couldn't it? So, yeah. Uh, look, we understand that there are competing priorities as academics and educators. There, You've been pulled from all different angles and your time is um, often very limited. There are different times of the year when we tend to get more engagement from academics or there might be TAs or PhD students that are working with you that may be able to support you as well. So four months is kind of a window that we work towards, but... We understand that it could take longer than that, and we've also seen it take um, a lot less time than that as well. Uh, I brought up this course, and on behalf of Azati, I've joined the course. <laughs> um, and one of the beauties of the, the types of courses on the platform is they are free at the front end. So uh, what I encourage all of you to do is find a course that might be of interest to you or might be in the discipline area that you're teaching in and undertake it. Actually go in and join the course for free. Have a look at the course content, the way it's all laid out. There's a couple of courses that we love that. Um, and the learners absolutely love them as well. I've brought one up here. It's called Fairy Tales, Meanings, Messages and Morals. It's from the University of Newcastle. And they've done beautiful videos in there. It's, I'll play this for you for a moment, but you can see the level of engagement. It really um, brings learners to the table. One of the things that I love 
in this first week is this icebreaker. So they've told us what we're going to explore. In here, you could ask that big question about what is up, what I'm going to find out about the course. But here it's just introduce yourself. Tell us why you're doing this course. And for something like fairy tales, you can imagine that the, the responses here, uh, you know, I used to read fairy stories to my children. I've been fascinated by fairy tales since I was given a large book of them. So you can see the, the engagement has begun right from the very beginning. I'm just going to play a little bit of this because you'll, you'll get a sense of what is experienced as well. Um, for anyone who uh, is audio impaired, there's always a transcript that's part of our accessibility. Likewise, you'll see um, um, subtitles as well that are available. Am I going to be able to hear that? Can you hear? No, okay. Okay. So you may not be able to hear that, which means that I encourage you to actually join the course and go and have a look at it. It's absolutely beautiful. She's reading like she's actually telling a story. Uh, she's got her little whiskey bottle set up here. Uh, you know, like it's a real, the background, it's almost like she's come out of a, a fairy tale herself. So if we can't hear it, there's no point sharing. Uh, you'll see most of the uh, videos that we have on the platform, they're not long. So this one is two minutes and 14 seconds. They're just long enough to keep the learner engaged. We don't go over 10 minutes for any of our videos. So there's courses like that that are absolutely fantastic, but I would also just encourage you to find a course that um, piques your interest and join the course and, and do it for free. Or you can pay for the upgrade as well. But it gives you a great idea how it's laid out, how the, um, the platform actually works. I think that's a, a better taster than anything that we can share with you is actually getting in hands on and doing it yourself. Are there any other questions? Any final questions? Okay, well, if there's no final questions, um, or indeed you do um, think of a question later on, uh, please reach out to the, the ADAC team and, and um, they'll be able to answer your question. And if not, they'll be able to redirect you to, towards us to, to be able to answer your questions. Um, we'd really like to thank you all for your time today. Um, and like I said, we're extremely excited by the, the prospects of getting uh, more uh, wonderful content from the University of Milan. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, thank you very much to uh, David and Yopna. So if you have further questions, uh, of course, uh, just come to us at that. We will be happy to help you and, of course, to support uh, your development uh, of um, future learning uh, uh, courses on the, our future learning platform. All right, so I think um, with that, um, uh, I'll bid you goodbye. Assalamualaikum. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.